I wonder how many of you have ever traveled across the Mackinac Bridge? Raise your hand. Ah, I kind of figured that it would be most of this crowd. You know, uh, the Mackinac Bridge, also known as the Mighty Mac, is a suspension bridge that spans the Straits of Mackinac to connect the upper and the lower peninsula of Michigan. It opened in 1957, and the 26,372 foot long bridge is the world's 24th longest main span and the longest suspension bridge between anchorages in the western hemisphere at five miles long. The length of the bridge's main span is 3,800 feet, which makes it the third longest suspension span in the United States and the 20th longest suspension span worldwide. At a July 1888 meeting of the board of directors of the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, Cornelius Vanderbilt II proposed that a bridge be built across the Straits because Mackinac Island and the area there was becoming more popular as a tourist attraction. But for years, nothing happened. And then finally, in 1923, the state legislature ordered that a ferry service uh, across the Straits be established and eventually as many as 9,000 vehicles a day used the ferry service to cross between the upper and the lower peninsulas. It often took as long as five hours to cross between the upper and lower peninsulas. And so, uh, you know, if you were trying to get to St. Ignace from Mackinac City or vice versa, just plan on taking your lunch with you and something to drink for sure. And by 1928, the ferry service had become so popular and so expensive to operate that Michigan Governor Fred Green ordered the State Highway Department to study the feasibility of building a bridge across the strait. The Highway Department deemed that the idea was feasible. They estimated that the cost at that time was $30 million, which is like $360 million today. And in 1950, engineers were hired to begin working on building a bridge. Construction of the bridge began in 1954 and it took three and a half years to build with the bridge opening up on schedule in November 1957. It cost $100 million to build back then, which is the equivalent of $708 million today. Tragically, it cost the lives of five workers. There's a total of 42,000 miles of wire in the main cables, which are two and a half feet in diameter. The height of the towers above the water is 552 feet. The maximum depth of the towers below the water is 210 feet. The bridge takes seven years to paint, and when they're done, they start all over again. <laughs> in 2005, the average daily vehicles crossing uh, average of the bridge was 11,608 per day. If you have Gephyrophobia, which is the fear of crossing bridges. The Mackinac Bridge Authority has a driver's assistance program where someone can drive you and your vehicle across the bridge for you, just in case you needed to know. The Mighty Mac bridges the gap and it connects us not only with these two land masses, but more importantly with other people, maybe even people that you really care about. And as I think about Hebrews chapter 7, as we continue in this message series through the book of Hebrews, the main thing I notice is that Jesus bridges the gap between us and God. He bridges the gap. And the writer of Hebrews, he discusses this in light of the role of the high priest, who served as a go-between between God and people, noting that Jesus is the superior way to get back to God. Jesus is superior because unlike the Straits of Mackinac, which can be crossed by swimming, if you're a really good swimmer and you're brave, or you could fly across it, or you could take a boat across it, or you could drive across the bridge. Unlike the Mackinac Bridge and getting to the other side, Jesus is the only way to God. Amen? He is the only way. 
So open up your Bible or your smartphone to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 28 today, and we're going to look at that more closely this morning. Hebrews 7, 1 through 10 says this. Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendant, his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Verse 8, in the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Well, that all leads to the question, who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness and king of peace. Already, just the meaning of this name and title, we can see why the writer of Hebrews uses Melchizedek as an illustration of Jesus. Melchizedek is a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus to show us what Jesus was going to be like. And when we think of Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords, we know that he is a king of righteousness and peace. That is how the Bible describes Jesus. Melchizedek shows up only in one place in the Old Testament, and then later he is referred to in Psalm 110, verse 4. But he's introduced to us as both the king of Salem, which is the present-day Jerusalem, and as the high priest from Salem in the days of Abraham nearly 4,000 years ago. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, Abraham returns from defeating the kings allied with Kedar Laomer, and this king of Salem, who was priest of God Most High, he goes out to meet and congratulate Abraham on his victory. And so Abraham, in recognition of God's protection and the victory he gained in this battle, he is blessed by Melchizedek, and Abraham gives a tenth of the spoils from the battle to Melchizedek. In other words, he tithed by giving to Melchizedek, thus acknowledging God's part in the victory. He gives thanks to God, and he acknowledges that Melchizedek was indeed a true priest of the Most High God, even before there was a Levitical priesthood established. And this is special because later, after God's law is given through Moses, priests could only come through the lineage of Aaron, which is the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek was not of that lineage. It indicates a kind of authority which comes only from God. It's not something you're born into. It's not something given to you. It comes only from God. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything of Melchizedek's lineage, which makes him even more special because even though he surely was born and died, he had parents but the fact that his birth and death isn't mentioned is used by the writer of Hebrews as an illustration of Jesus' eternal nature. And that's one reason why the writer of Hebrews is making the point that Melchizedek was a type of priest who foreshadowed and modeled the kind of priest that Jesus the Messiah was. We don't read anything in the Bible about Melchizedek dying, which relates to Jesus and his resurrection. Just as Melchizedek's priesthood lasted forever since his death is never recorded in the Bible, in the same way, Jesus' function as our high priest is forever because he resurrected from the dead and he is alive forever. But we know that Melchizedek eventually died because he was only human and we know that at that point his ministry would have ended. But with Jesus, 
his ministry never again because he resurrected from the dead did they need to get another high priest to replace him see with Jesus there will never again be a need for another high priest because Jesus' ministry is high priest it never ends Jesus gives us the security of being our go-between between between us and God forever. He is our bridge to heaven, and his resurrection is the proof of his power as God. Well, that's just a summary of who Melchizedek is from what we know in those few short verses in the Bible. And that's why he is used as an illustration of who Jesus would be. It's kind of mysterious kind of difficult to understand because we're not Jewish Christians like the readers to whom Hebrews was originally written. Melchizedek would definitely have helped those Christians, those first readers of Hebrews, understand why they should continue to stand with Jesus no matter what hardships they're going through. Because you see, our sin has created this huge gap between God and us, and so God put a priesthood in place to help us get back to him. But now, after Jesus, the old ways of bridging the gap between God and people by having priests sacrifice animals on their behalf are gone. There is no longer going to be that old way of living. There's no going back to that, even though it might seem like it would make life easier again. And I think sometimes maybe we think it would be easier just to kind of walk away from God. Sometimes we think it would just be easier just to walk away from the church and our faith and never mess around with it again. But we must not do that. We too must stand strong with Jesus no matter what we go through because God now works through each of us as priests to represent him to people and to point them to God. Melchizedek helps us remember why Jesus is so special. Well, what do we discover about Jesus from Melchizedek? Jeff Snell in his book, Strength for the Journey, shares some insights about this. I'd like for us to consider today four things that we learn about Jesus from the life of Melchizedek. First, Hebrews 7, verses 11 through 16 reveals that God took the initiative in reaching out to us. He took that initiative. Here's what we read in verses 11 through 16. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also, and he of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. You see, God knew of our need for a way by which we could have a thriving relationship with him. He knew we were going to have that need. And this whole idea of having priests to represent people to God and to represent God to the people was God's idea. He's always wanted fellowship with us. But sin has separated us. And even though other religions might also have some kind of priesthood, The idea of a priesthood did not start with people. It was God's idea. And it was established by God. And so we should shout to God for praise for this. Because what it means is that God has always provided a way by which people could express relationship with him. And Jesus came into our world when we couldn't go up into his. He was born a baby. And even though he was God... He limited his own divine power by becoming human. He did that so that he could relate to us. He did that to show us more accurately the ways of God. But most importantly, he did that to become our bridge back to God. God took the initiative in reaching out to us. 
That leads to a second thing <clears throat> we learn about Jesus from the life of Melchizedek. Secondly, Jesus is the only bridge to God. Hebrews 7, 17 through 19 tells us, For it is declared, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And so what the Hebrews writer is telling us is that like a bridge that spans a body of water, Jesus is the way by which we draw near to God. Laws and rules can't ultimately fill that gap. They just can't do it. Only Jesus can. You know, today there are a lot of other people, and there's a lot of other philosophies and practices claiming to have special insight as to how we can get back to God and how to have a connection to the inner you, right? The authentic you. But when God says, <clears throat> you are a priest forever, He's saying that Jesus is the only bridge to God. Jesus declared this same truth about himself when he says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through who? Except through me. Even the worship practices of the Old Testament pointed forward to the superior blessings that we have in Jesus the Jewish temple and the sacrificial system of atoning for sins was never intended to be something permanent because everyone knew the Messiah was on the way. Knowing all the Old Testament laws cannot remove the times that we have sinned. It can only serve to teach us what sin is and convict us when we have rebelled against God. But Jesus is our bridge to God because he doesn't just point out our sins to us. He gets rid of them through the sacrifice of himself on the cross on our behalf. If I want to get from Mackinac City to St. Ignace, I can get a boat and I can ride over on the water, or I can drive my car over the bridge. But there's only one way from where we are right now to where God is, and that is by Jesus. All other efforts, no matter how sincere, are futile. So stand strong with Jesus. Here's yet a third insight about Jesus from the life of Melchizedek. Jesus' resurrection eternally establishes our connection with God. That's what Hebrews 7, 20 through 25 is saying. It says, And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of these priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. Verse 24, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That is such good news for you and me. The resurrection proves that there is also life after death for us. Life beyond the grave is not mere speculation. It is an undeniable demonstration of God's power. Jesus promised, because I live, you also will live. The Bible assures us in Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit. Who lives in you. See, because of Easter and the resurrection of Christ, we have the assurance that the best is yet to be. Eternity awaits us. There will be ecstatic reunions. There will be unspeakable joy. There will be endless praise. As the old hymn Amazing Grace puts it, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we've first begun. Jesus' resurrection from the dead eternally connects us with God, the giver of life. Well, here's one last thing I can mention about Jesus that we learn from the life and ministry of Melchizedek. Yet another reason why we should never give up on our faith. Number four, 
Jesus' intercession for us is characterized by an unparalleled morality. Hebrews 7, 26 through 28 ends the chapter with this. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy and blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. When it comes to Jesus, you never have to wonder about his motives. When it comes to Jesus, you never have to wonder whether or not he lived what he said he believed. When it comes to Jesus, you never have to wonder if he was His thinking and teaching about God were clouded by sinful desires and sin in his life. Jesus and his word establishes an absolute standard for truth. Now many in our world today suggest that there is no definitive right and wrong. In fact, I was watching a TV show last night when somebody who was obviously in obvious outright rebellion and sin against God had said, you are celebrating me and we just thank you for that. And they were celebrating sin. Well, that is our culture, right? Many in our world suggest that we should do that. Our culture's values are just as, you know, one value is just as legitimate as others, what our culture teaches. But the Apostle Paul informed the intellectual elite in Athens about his encounter with the one true God. When he concluded, as we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 31... He says, for God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. And so God will judge us by the perfect standard of Jesus Christ who insisted, I am the truth. No wonder God makes belief in Jesus the ultimate requirement for salvation. Last fall, my wife and I We traveled across the Mackinac Bridge as we participated in a treasure hunt. We didn't come back with any treasure, but we came back with memories and lots of photos, one from which I I painted this picture of, of the Mighty Mac. Many of you have crossed the Mackinac Bridge in the past. Maybe you're going to cross it sometime this summer when you're on vacation. In light of the truths of Hebrews 7, perhaps we can start looking at bridges differently. Whether you're crossing a little culvert that takes you across the ditch, or whether you're crossing the bridge in Ovid that takes you across the Maple River, or whether you're driving the Mighty Mac to head to the UP and back again, every bridge we see or cross can serve as a reminder of what Jesus has done and is still doing for us. Without him, It would be impossible for us to reach God. And that's why we need to stand strong with Jesus and never, ever give up. When all is said and done, you'll be glad that you stood with Jesus because your faith in him will be proved correct. You will be in his presence directly. You will see him face to face. And at that point, you will be standing on the right side of history. There are all kinds of treasures we search for, only to end up empty-handed. Just like Julie and I last fall, (laughs) when we traipsed all over Mackinac County looking for treasure. But there is only one thing that's certain. Jesus and the relationship between us and God, and the fact that he reestablishes that relationship if we believe in him and we are united with him in baptism. He's the bridge back to God. And he's the bridge to God's perfect heaven. So never give up believing in him. Continue speaking forth his truth respectfully, even when others challenge you. But stand strong with him. If you believe that this morning, say it with me. I will stand strong. I will stand strong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Sometimes it feels like 
we're standing alone in a culture and in a world that has deserted you, that rebels against you, that calls right wrong and wrong right. And that can be a little perplexing sometimes. It can be a little scary sometimes. But God, we recognize that when we are standing with Jesus, we will stand strong no matter what prevails around us. Jesus once said the gates of Hades cannot prevail against him and, and your heaven. And Lord, we believe that today. We thank you for Jesus whose resurrection gives us eternal life and an eternal relationship with you. We do not take that for granted, but we live our faith intentionally. We will not leave Jesus in this room when we walk out this morning from this building. We will walk out hand in hand with him, knowing that he abides, he's with us. May your strength and your blessing and your favor be with each one, worshiping you today, whether here in person or online through Facebook Live. God, we're going to give you the glory. We're going to stand strong with you till we go home. Because we know this world is not all that it was meant to be. You created it perfect. We messed it up. Thank you for Jesus who's restoring it and redeeming it all over again. Redeeming our lives. We're going to stand strong with you. In Jesus' name we pray.